Hi everyone, I'm Kyle Dyer and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, June 21st. Let me go right to introducing you to our insiders. The panelists for this week, we have Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward, Tyrone Glover, leading criminal defense and civil rights attorney here in Denver, Jesse Paul, reporter and editor with the Colorado Sun, and also Ian Thomas DeFoya, a community leader and former candidate for mayor of Denver. Colorado's primary election is Tuesday. You can fill out your ballot and turn it in if you haven't already anytime this weekend through one of those ballot boxes or vote in person by 7 o'clock Tuesday night, okay? It is not too late to take part. At stake, we have congressional and legislative races, state board of education, and also CU regent posts, and many more leadership positions at the local level throughout Colorado. It's going to be a big day Tuesday. This primary means a lot, Patty. Well, also at stake is some of our dignity there have been so many cynical moves through this primary. You have, let's start in District 3, where you have the Boebert move into District 4 when Ken Buck announced he wasn't running again. So you have this person come into a very agricultural Eastern Plains district, and basically it looks like Boebert will take it, Jerry Sonnenberg won't win, you will not have a working farmer in, the, in Congress from Colorado. But over in District 3, you have Adam Frisch and Dark Money, which is now paying to make Ron Hanks look attractive to voters, just so Jeff Hurd might be knocked out. And that is such a cynical ploy. And then, of course, we have the worst in District 5. We have the Dave Williams, who continues to be absolutely without shame. I just saw James Dobson had endorsed him. You know, God should be striking people left and right in this election. It is unbelievable what's happened in District 5 and that Nancy Pelosi and Jeff Coe, I had complimented her last week, which obviously was the kiss of death, because she has now been chided by her own executive committee for leading the petition to get Dave Williams out. Out of being the chair of the GOP. Right. He's still on the running. We'll find out Tuesday what happens with him. Tyrone. And a race that isn't maybe getting the big headlines, but I think is very important to the community in Denver is our district attorney race. Uh, John Walsh, Leora Joseph. When you look at really, I think, the issues that are motivating voters uh, this cycle, uh, homelessness, public safety, um, immigration, the DA's office intersects with all of these and how we approach these certain things. So while there's maybe not the big headlines and, and the nightly news coverage, there really is a wealth of information uh, done by a number of news outlets. And folks who are voting in Denver should really pay attention because these folks are going to be shaping criminal justice reform and criminal justice prosecutions for years and years to come. Yeah, and another DA race that I think will be interesting is down in the new 23rd Judicial District, Douglas County, and some of the counties out east. The Republican primary there features Dagny Vander Yad, who's kind of a far-right uh, prosecutor type aligned with, with Dave Williams folks types in, in the Republican Party. And then George Brockler, uh, who used to be the 22nd, 21st Judicial District, I might get the district wrong, uh, DA, kind of making a political comeback there, trying to, to step back up and be a, a local prosecutor. But my focus outside of the congressional races, races which are really important, uh, will be Democratic legislative primaries on Tuesday. It will be really fascinating. There's six or seven where there's been $3 million plus spent uh, trying to duke it out between more progressive candidates and more moderate candidates. And the outcome of these races really could affect the trajectory of policy discussions at the, the legislature, uh, uh, energy policy, environmental policy, things that Ian cares a lot about. And I think uh, it could say a lot about where the electorate is in Colorado in terms of how far left we are. We know we're, we're a Democratic-leaning state, but how far left do we want to go? And I think voters will provide us with at least a, a pretty sizable answer uh, on Tuesday. It's an interesting point you're making, Patty, about no farmers, because I've traveled all across those areas, and certainly farming is at the heart of it. And with the farm bill being so important, uh, these are the kind of issues uh, that I think those voters would be voting on. But we know money and name ID make such a big difference, and that's one thing that Bober does have and what she took on the road with her to that district. On the state level, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, what's at stake is a more moderate or more liberal Senate, which could mean a lot for facing off with Governor Polis in the last few years and whether he's willing to veto uh, in his last couple years. I'll 
say everything is local. Uh, there's so many issues that because we don't have enough money going into local media that don't get covered. There are people on commissions and local electeds who play such a critical role in making decisions when you're not paying attention and no one's trying to tell you what's happening. And so it's important that people vote. I've had this conversation with at least Paul Lopez here in Denver, but we need to put up more regalia banners. We need to have more public understanding about voting. We light up our city for the Nuggets or the Broncos, but not for voting. There's no reason why we shouldn't use these resources. You buy them once, you put them up again. We need to drive it up. And I vote on election day, so I'm part of the people who haven't voted yet. But I like to go in and in person. My mom and I used to do that when I was a kid. So. Okay. All right. Uh, Jesse, you wrote this week how Joe Neguse got involved. Last week we talked about how Governor Polis got involved in one of the state races making an endorsement, and Joe Neguse did as well this week. Yeah, so House District 6 in Denver, folks have been following it. It's Representative Elizabeth Epps is facing a challenge from Denver Attorney Sean Camacho. Epps is more on the left side, and Camacho is more on the moderate side. And yeah, Representative Neguse jumped in the fray of a Democratic primary to endorse Camacho. And I, I think one of the interesting things, too, that I'll note is I asked Governor Polis this week, you know, can you talk a little bit more about your decision to endorse in some of these legislative races this year? You haven't done that in the past. And he said, actually, I have let endorsed in the past, but this is the first time I've endorsed someone against a sitting lawmaker. So he also endorsed Camacho against Epps and, and made a very big point to say, I'm, I, you know, I want to highlight that I'm doing this. Uh, this weekend also brings the 50th anniversary of Pride Fest in Denver, and the celebrations come amidst a lot of news this week, um, Tyrone, especially in the courts regarding to the LGBTQ plus community. Yes, Kyle. We have Masterpiece Cake, excuse me, Masterpiece Cake Shop, too. Um, and for, I think, non-legal scholars, it's, I think, difficult to really understand, I think, some of the nuances between the first Masterpiece Cake Shop, Creative 303, uh, this most recent one. The facts in this one, I think, are just so plainly you know, obvious. The, the, the cake is a pretty innocuous cake. Um, one color on the outside, one color on the inside. It was directed specifically what to do by the person who was ordering the cake. There's no discretion or artistic, um, I guess, sort of nuance from the actual baker. So, you know, we have the potential for expressive conduct under these circumstances to go so far that anything that a corporation does can essentially be seen as some form of expression or art, right? And we have a constitutional pr uh, premise, right, um, freedom of speech that could potentially swallow up other constitutional principles like equal protection, like our long legacy of civil rights laws. Uh, we can't allow that to happen. We can't allow free speech to allow widespread discrimination um, because the court goes too far. So hopefully this is a pretty obvious one, but if it's not, and if it goes up to the uh, Supreme Court of the United States and we get a similar result, um, I fear we could see some really unintended consequences for years to come. And I also just wonder, like, how many similar cases like this we're going to see between, out of Colorado, whether it's cakes or websites and, and things like that uh, in terms of LGBT rights. I think for whatever reason, Colorado has become kind of a hotbed for that issue, uh, even though, again, it's, it's a pretty left-leaning state. Uh, the other big court news in the LGBT community is, you know, the club Q shooter uh, pleaded guilty in federal court this week. I think that how fast that case moved is really remarkable, both on the state and federal levels, to have a resolution within two years in, on both sides of that you know, criminal coin, I think is really interesting. Uh, but I also hope it doesn't fall out of you know, people's thoughts and prayers and, and thinking and remembering kind of what happened there as someone who covered that shooting. And also it's important to remember that a lot of these cases don't you know, have resolutions quickly. The Planned Parenthood shooting was something that I covered as a young journalist uh, back in 2015. And that case is still pending both on the state and federal level. So uh, not everything moves as quickly as this case did. So I think that should be celebrated, but also recognized in terms of what it means for the survivors and, and the victims' families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would just note on to that end, um, you know, a number of these cases that would drag on for years and years and years and re-traumatize uh, victims were ones when we still had the death penalty here in Colorado. And I think these sort of horrendous crimes can come to uh, resolution um, much quicker that we don't have to go through all of the procedural safeguards for the death penalty. So I think that's something that wasn't necessarily um, put forth when it was eradicated, but it's, you know, I think probably an intended and unintended consequence that at the end of the day, we're able to get justice for victims and get closure much quicker. Well, I certainly am fearful of anything that goes to the court system these days, because ultimately if it makes it to the Supreme Court, I feel like there's been a lot that's been rolled back to protect our community members. That, and I think that, 
I really question, does it make sense for Supreme Court justices to have lifetime appointments? We need to have some sort of transition. No one else gets to serve forever. I'll say that Denver, in celebrating this 50 years, I really want us on own. Like, we have our own bad history. We had occupancy limits and renter discrimination and workplace discrimination. So we have to own that. And then on top of that, we can celebrate with our community this weekend. I do think there is fear out there. I talked to some friends who say, you know, I just don't want to go out there. But that's a lot of festivals these days because we haven't got a hold of our gun control problem. And it can happen to people almost in any place. And I totally recognize that. As I was preparing for this, I was thinking actually about when I marched in the parade, I welcome people to march in the parade with my mom. My mom worked for Mikasa Resource Center and we marched in the parade as a kid. And it's such a vivid memory. So I say go out there, enjoy yourself, and uh, let's continue to fight for equal rights for all people. And one of the parties I'll be at is Pink Party this weekend for One Colorado, so I hope people join. When I saw Dobson's name endorsing Dave Williams, it brings back Amendment 2. When we became the hate state, when Colorado passed that no special privileges or however you interpret it for gay people back in 1992, it took us years to live down that reputation that most of us thought Colorado didn't have. We thought we were a libertarian, live and let live state. And to find out there was this residual of hate, hatred was shocking to many of us. And that's why the Dave Williams response in the last month has again brought up the how can someone really when you look at your friends and your sisters and your brothers and the number of people who have fought for more than 50 years now to be recognized and given equal treatment and when you see what Colorado the Colorado Republican Party is doing it's just appalling so I hope people who are out there at this 50th anniversary party really celebrate really take pat themselves on the back for the number of strides that have been made, but remember there is still hate out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's touch again on affordability. It's a huge umbrella topic, I know. Denver City Council floated a new number this week that the city will pay close to $155 million by the end of the year to help house those who are homeless in the All in Mile High program. Also this week, we saw contract negotiations uh, going for the 28, 2300 unionized janitors who work in our downtown buildings. And there is an effort at, in Denver to also you, you know, do collective bargaining for other city and county employees because it comes to this affordability issue, being able to afford to live in this city. Um, Jesse, I know you work a lot with the legislative stuff. Um, there's always talk about you know, the affordability issues. I'll help you start this. Yeah, so th thinking about elections right now, right? I mean, the Colorado Sun and a bunch of news outlets across the state went and asked voters, you know, what are your top issues heading to this election? And no surprise that affordability is, is high up on the list. But I think what's been fascinating is talking to uh, you know, candidates about this, nobody has any silver bullet solutions. And, and you see that too at the legislature, right? I mean, there's nothing you can do that uh, will make a house that's $2 million, a $1 million overnight. And so these things take a lot of time. There's disagreement about how to uh, go forth. And then also when you talk to the congressional candidates, they basically say, like, look, there's not much we can do in D.C. anyways on this. So I think folks are, are looking for solutions from that. I don't think that their elected leaders have a lot of answers. And as much as they want this you know, election to be a referendum on this issue. I just don't think politicians can offer them answers that would make it that way. Okay, Ian, let's talk about the push to have more city employees um, become former unions to get better pay and better benefits. Yes, there's been an effort afoot that's what collecting signatures for a charter amendment and also a process that's going on in parallel through City Hall with the mayor's office and city councils, I understand it. Uh, bill just filed, so they'll have a first hearing on Monday. I think there's a press conference 3 p.m. if people want to hear it. Stronger Denver, the idea, and as a city worker, I get it, uh, that the, your work conditions matter to you. And our city would be stronger if people had the right to collectively bargain. And it's not just about wages. Workplace safety and so many other pieces come into play. Even when times are tough, having the ability to go as a team to negotiate what kind of reductions people are going to be taking in harsh times. And we've had them over the last few years dealing with a lot of crisis. We already have parity for in the safety side of the city in order to unionize. Why shouldn't our trash collectors, our librarians, our social workers also have that same right to do that? We have Denver health workers who are trying to unionize the art museum. You're seeing nonprofits like Denver Urban Gardens and the Coalition for the Homeless. It is an affordability issue. It's a rights issue. And I'm glad to see that that's happening in our city. And on a federal level, we need their help. There are bills that have put forward $100 billion about the same we've been sending to war that would solve homelessness in America. We've had the bills for years, and there's coalitions that are fighting for them. Mm -hmm. Patty. 
come November, we will certainly see that people care about affordability as we see the votes on the property tax proposals. So that's going to be big. But I also think Denverites in particular are looking, it's not just, they're wondering what they're getting for their city, from their city, which might affect the collective bargaining push too. They still, they're paying for trash, but they don't have their composting bins. There was the sidewalk threat, but it's not coming through. They're paying huge property taxes now. They're seeing that 911 calls aren't answered as fast and 311 calls aren't answered as fast. So I think we're gonna, and they're peeved that we're paying maybe 155 million, maybe a different amount, because it's also very vague coming out of the city. So I think we're gonna see people being a lot more discontent as they add up the bills they're paying this year and head to the ballot box or the mailbox in November. It baffles me with as large of a city worker footprint that we have that we don't have a union. Um, and so I'm very much in support of those efforts. You know, my partner works for the city. Um, and I don't think that you know, we should allow, you know, folks dissatisfaction with the allocation of resources to allow city workers to deliver, deliver services uh, to the community to be sort of weaponized against efforts to collectively bargain, uh, to unionize, to come together. I think that we can uh, have both. And at the end of the day, uh, a unionized workforce can also hold feet to the fire for those in power to make sure that uh, resources are allocated appropriately to deliver services uh, to folks who live in their communities. Yeah, okay. Uh, this week, national bookstore chain Barnes & Noble. And it was a big new, news story. Offered to buy independent bookseller Tattered Cover, just like the movie. You got mail, right? I saw a post on X that said, sad, why can't we keep anything that is good? And this week I'd say there are efforts underway to keep some of the good around saving the Tattered Cover. Also, El Chapultepec. Let's start with you, Ian, because you worked with that with Historic Denver to try to save part of that building and the new plans to redo that block. Yes, I'm a trustee of Historic Denver, and we reached a compromise with the Monforts. I think that's really good. The city's going to change. There's an opportunity to talk about place and culture. Buildings allow us to do that. It's not the only way to tell our history. I think it's nuanced. With the Rizonian project, people are talking about here on Five Points. You know, there is a great story that I'm sure uh, Patty's going to talk about that I was just so impressed by that told a great story of how much money's gone into that, and yet we still haven't been able to open a hotel to serve the community and so or a business to serve the community. You know, economic development and supporting the businesses that are already here, that's what I heard when I was running for mayor. You hear people say it's always about what's new, the new people who are moving here, the construction that's building something new, and it's not backfilling my, you know, my ability to pay my workers from the lost business that's taking place here. We need some sort of revolving loan funds when their windows get smashed. We're not doing enough to support the people who have been here before, and I think that that's a choice. And we're going to continue to see businesses turn over until we support supporting legacy businesses. And that doesn't mean we can't help the others. I just I clearly see that there's a lane where we're not doing enough for those individuals. Interesting, Patty. Well, we've been driving past the Rossonian every Friday when we come up to film, and we've written stories about the Rossonian really since Westward started because it's such a stunning building. It is right at the corner of Five Points, so it's triangular. It's a landmark in what is the city's first cultural historic district, Five Points, and really since the 70s, it has been dead. There have been a few attempts to resurrect it. There's been millions of dollars, including city money, poured into it that hasn't gone anywhere. The DHA lived there, uh, was housed there for a while, which was the last real signs of life. But we need some, that to make a comeback of whatever kind. Given the money we put into it, we have to put that part of the heart and soul of the history of the jazz community. And when this was the black neighborhood, the heart of Denver, we need that to come back. Tattered Cover is another thing that is a hallmark of the community. It, the original buildings aren't still there. Or I should say their locations aren't still there. But the Lowenstein is another example of a cultural facility that we need to have as a gathering place to show we care about culture, we care about history, we care about being together in a positive way. The Lowenstein is the current building on Colfax. On Colfax that also has the C Film Center and mm -hmm. it has Twist and Shout, and it's a cultural center for us. It sounds like the if Barnes & Noble does go through, they want to keep it as is. They want to keep it and they want to extend the lease, so that's hopeful. Okay. Tyrone. And I agree with Patty. It's, it, it's hopeful. It's a shame that you know, these legacy uh, businesses could not survive on just community support. 
um, and that we do have you know, these corporations, corporate partners coming in uh, to essentially bail them out. But you reference, you know, you've got mail earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I'll remind you about that movie is, yeah, Fox Books came in and they opened up and then you know Meg Ryan's around the corner was no more and that was sort of the narrative I remember you know in past decades where the big corporate conglomerate would come in and all of the small local businesses would go out of business so it's I guess somewhat hopeful and maybe a leading indicator of things to come that they're listening to the community and when they come in they're leaving things like the tattered cover as is they're instead of you know doing something completely different with the Rosonian. They're you know, trying to fix it up to make it actually open. And they're building kind of on top and around uh, El Chapultepec, but you know, they're keeping parts of it intact. Mm-hmm. So you know, in a couple of decades, you know, maybe we will have a situation where these businesses um, have the resources to stay open on their own. But I feel like this is better than what we saw in past decades. Okay, Jesse. As someone who uh, used to work at the Denver Post, I like to think a lot about institutions in in Denver and uh, Colorado and trying to keep them in place. And I think the reality is that it kind of falls onto all of us, right? The community, it's incumbent upon people who live in Colorado who care about these places to patronize the Tattered Cover or Casa Bonita or Tom's Diner or the Rossoni, whatever, uh, to make them financially viable. And so I, you know, I, we're talking about voting this week because the primary election is coming up, but people also have to vote with their wallets too. So if they care about things in their community, if it's a a restaurant or a store or whatever, you got to patronize it or it's going to go away. And so, um, you know, I've lived here now for 15 years in Colorado, and, and I think a lot of people who move here don't don't have that sense of place or ownership of, you know, this is my home. And I think more of us need to kind of adopt that and recognize that, uh, you know, we can't rely on others to, to prop everything else up. We all have to be in this together and, and support places like the Tatter Cover. Now it is time for us to go through the panel and talk about some of the highs and the lows of the week. We'll start always with the low points so we can end on a happy note. Patty, I will start with you. Okay, here's something we can all do something about. So Biker Jim, Jim Pittenger, who had the first gourmet hot dog stand out on the mall in 2005. Anthony Bourdain loved it. Different people loved it. It literally put us on the culinary map nationally. He got involved in a bad business part deal. He is out of the business, he says. We should bring him back in. We should put him back on the mall. If downtown Denver wants to have a drawing card, Biker Jim back on the mall. He's as beloved in some ways as the tattered cover was. Get him back. And I agree. My first uh, summer associateship was right next to Biker Jim, um, and we would frequent his establishment quite often. Um, My, um, I think, sort of shame of the week. The last week, actually, the internal affairs report came out about Missy Woods, uh, the DNA and the analysts who had, you know, we'll call them improprieties with her analytics and reports for over 20 years. And there's a potential that this has affected hundreds of criminal cases, ones where people are doing, uh, you know, very significant, sometimes life sentences. Um, so the internal investigation, the full thing is not completely released yet, but uh, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation has released some of the highlights, and it seems to be as bad as we thought, and hopefully uh, you know, we'll be committed going forward to trying to remedy um, and redress some of the damage done. I've never had a Biker Jim's hot dog, so I just want to uh, out myself there. I am the Cookie Lady Republic Plaza food oh. court. Uh, uh, that's my era, so I miss all those things. I just have to say, you know, dark money in so many of these legislative races and, and in CD3 as well uh, is really, I think, going to confuse the heck out of voters, and uh, I don't know what to do about campaign finance. I'm not going to take a position on that, but um, I think it's not great when voters are confused and don't understand what, what's going on, and we're doing our best to uncover it, but it, it's, a, it's a thing. Mine is a, a recent report that was released by tribal scholars and legal historians who found that Colorado was founded on 1.7 trillion dollars of stolen land to over 10 tribes. It's about 800 page report. I've downloaded it and I'm digging through it. I had heard about this through community groups that were working on it locally, local nonprofits serving Native Americans. And so to hear that this report come out, I don't know what the outcomes are going to be, but you're continuing to see this. We saw this in the Columbia River Basin as well, where the U.S. government and the Department of Interior admitted that what they've done to the Columbia River has caused irreparable harm to tribal nations. Thanks for bringing that up. A really great and aged institution, the Highline Canal. What the Highline Canal Conservancy has been doing has been incredible to bring back this 71-mile gem really through Metro Denver. And yesterday, Denver Water announced that they are going to move most of its possession of of the Highline Canal to Arapahoe County, which will help 
bring this all together. It's really a wonderful thing. If you haven't been on it, you should enjoy it. Absolutely. Something positive from you, Tyrone. Yeah, and I'm just going to revisit uh, Pride this weekend. Okay. I just I think it's you know, 50th anniversary um, and has grown to be one of the biggest, largest Pride celebrations in the country. Um, you know, a lot of progress, but a lot of progress still to be made um, and just so many great events. I'm just encouraging all folks to go out. Uh, Ian, I might see you at the pink party. Jesse. A uh, half million folks had cast ballots as of our filming of this episode, and uh, while that's still a low number, that's it's great to see that, that folks are turning in their ballots, obviously. Some people hold on to theirs to the last minute, and that's fine, so just get out there and vote. As long as you do it before 7 p.m. on Election Day, you'll be on my uh, good list. Okay. I want to shout out the Denver Basic Income Project to release some of their results uh, in combination with the University of Denver. I, I think the lot remains to be seen to digest it, but some of these outcomes are truly transformational. One story I read about someone who's exactly my age who got a traumatic brain injury because they were struck by a car, got their credit score up, got their GED, their kids and their families are stable. Uh, not every story is going to be that way, but I think this is exactly what these kind of programs are designed to show us. And this is the program where people were, who are experiencing homelessness, tough times, were given money to then go and manage and there Universal are positive basic outcomes. income to make decisions yourself on how to get yourself more stable. That's good. Good to see positive outcomes on that. My absolute high of the week came on Monday night when I was watching with my girls the time trials and their teammate, Emma Weber, their former teammate, uh, came from behind at the very last minute in the 100 breaststroke to play second in the Olympic time trial, securing her spot to going to Paris on, with Team USA. Emma swam at Regis Jesuit High School, the same school and team that was once home to five-time medal winner, Missy Franklin. So uh, my girl swam with Emma at Regis. She's now at Virginia and has really had an amazing year and she's a nice girl. So I know there are other swimmers and divers from Colorado who are competing right now to make Team USA. I just have to give a shout out to Emma because she really had an outstanding commanding performance on Monday night. Thank you insiders for joining us this week for your insight, so appreciate it. Thank you for watching as well or listening to our podcast have a great weekend. Get downtown if you can. I'm Kyle Dyer. I will see you next week here on the Guest Fall. PBS 12 believes in the power of original, local programming. Help us bring more shows, like the one you just watched, by donating at pbs12.org slash program support today.